Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 is the text. We've been on Colossians 2, 8 for quite a while, and honestly, I do not want to leave verse 8. I feel like we could do a whole lot more work there, but we would have to exhaust every ism that there is, and that would take a while. But nevertheless, uh, Colossians 2, 9 is our text tonight. And we're going to do 3D Bible study. If you do not have the 3D Bible study sheet, I'd encourage you to go over to the welcome desk and get one. It's the handy size to keep in your Bible. So Colossians 2, 9 is where we're at. Let's read verse 8 to get us going in the right direction. By the way, if those of you who are watching online, if you want us to mail you one of these or some of these, please uh, email me at pastorcaseybutner at gmail.com or contact us one way or another on our website, bbcwg.org, and we would love to email you a digital copy or mail you some hard copies. So thank you for watching. Nevertheless, um, I do believe that one of the greatest things missing in our Christian culture today is Bible study because Bible study enables you to be able to discern what's true or not. And if you do not know how to rightly divide God's word, then you do not know if the preacher or the pastor or the TBN guy is telling the truth. And so we want you to be able to take and be a good Berean. Take the information that's said to you, take it home and study God's word and the 3D Bible study sheet is um, one way that we equip you to be able to study. So we'll read the text and then we'll pray. Colossians, and let's read verse eight as well, eight and nine. Colossians 2, eight, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Let's pray. Father, the first thing on our 3D Bible study sheet, number one, is to divert and pray and read the text. And you have given us your word, Lord, to dispense truth to us so that we could know more about you. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear from heaven today. Help us to understand the text as you have written it so that we can be in alignment with you. Lord, help us to know more about you tonight. Forgive us where we have erred. Forgive our sins, dear Lord. And even now, if we have unconfessed sin in our life individually, may we cry out uh, from our heart to you and say, God, forgive me. Help us to be holy before you. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving us of our sins. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Diverting and praying before you do Bible study is key. Uh, it slows you down. It eliminates all of the worldly distractions. It helps you to focus. And then we, help, uh, we, we encourage you to read the text again, even slow down a little bit more. So let's read uh, verse 9 slower and examine the text just a little bit as four that's going to take what has already been established and pour into you a principle four so picture all of what has already been said and now aim it at this potent statement for in him all the fullness all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So for in him, in the NIV, the NIV replaces the word him, or the pronoun him with Christ. So for in Christ, all the fullness of deity in him dwells. And the word all in the HSC uh, SB is entire. So in him, the entire fullness of deity dwells. And also in the ESV, it says for in him, all or it replaces the word all with the wholeness of God. And so the whole part of the deity is fully in Christ. And then for the word deity, the King James uses the word Godhead, and that is the title for tonight's Bible study, Jesus the God-man. And then as well for the word deity, the NIV as well replaces that in their most modern translation with the word nature. Now, just to be clear, I view the NIV as the nearly inspired translation, so don't quote me on these things. 
All right, and then dwells. What does the word dwell mean? Well, that is the verb of the sentence here. And dwells is also meaning lives. And so all of this deity lives in bodily form in Christ. So here we see that this statement is not one that is original to this letter. It has already been repeated. Turn to chapter 1, verse 19, and you'll see where all the fullness has already been established in that it is in Christ. Chapter 1, verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And so this is a repeated concept. And on your 3D Bible study sheet, number two, dig, says to dig into some words, identify some nouns and some verbs, read the references and note the repeated words. Here, this repeated phrase helps us to understand the theme that's being established. It's pretty interesting that the New Century Version kind of condenses this idea in this. It says it this way, all of God lives fully in Christ. And that is the essence of the verse. All of God lives fully in Christ. And so as we continue to dig, let's take a look at some of these important words and then continue to dig deeper and get diamonds. So the word all. Now here in the context, the Gnostics taught that the divine attributes were spread out through created beings. They were divided up. And so... The reason this letter is being written is to combat heresy. And one of the attributes of Gnostic heresy is that the divine essence is divided up. But here, Paul is combating that. He uses the word all in verse 9. For in him all the fullness. Now picture a pie graph and follow my train of thought here. In verse 8, there's phrase after phrase after phrase after phrase, and each phrase attacks a particular part of Gnosticism. So let's read verse 8 and think it through. See to it that no one takes you captive through what? Philosophy, worldly philosophies, that's one. An empty deception, that's another. According to the tradition of men, that's another. According to the elementary principles of the world, the basic principles, it's a dig on Gnosticism. How many of you like sarcasm? There it is. All right. They claim to have the highest knowledge available, and Paul called it elementary. Very basic. Ha, ha, ha. So there's the dig for those of you who love it. It's great. So the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. Now picture this pie graph and think of the full deity of Christ. Okay. All of Christ dwells in him in bodily form. Now let's divide that up according to what the Gnostics are trying to say. Well, part of the deity, we need to squeeze in some of this worldly philosophy. And how does that apply to our life today? Well, we know what the Gnostics are saying, but what do worldly people say today that would distort the deity of Christ? They would say inadvertently something like this. There's many things that they would say, but one thing that they would say would be, I'm a good person, right? They stand on their own self-sufficiency and they say, I'm a good person. They don't realize that that deludes the deity of Christ and even nullifies the atonement of the cross. And so that worldly philosophy is juxtaposed to what Paul is establishing here. So the worldly philosophies. And then as well, the tradition of men. You could go on and on and on about what that could apply to our life today. But one of the largest heresies on the planet would be Roman Catholicism in how they would add what they would call sacred tradition or church doctrine to the scriptures and they would put them two together to establish truth. Now we know, especially around here, that Jesus is the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through him. And so we're talking about Jesus and his deity here. But if you take this pie graph illustration and you try and squeeze some of the sacred tradition of any ism, any Jehovah's Witness theology, any Mormonism, any Catholicism or anything, then you're diluting who Christ is and it goes against what Paul is saying and that all of the fullness dwells in Christ. And the same thing for 
other areas of this verse. And so you could go on and on and on and dissect this thing, but just know that Paul is saying that all of the fullness of Christ is in his incarnation, in bodily form. So, and as, um, as you go through and you think of Christ not being fractured up, you're going to have a high view of Christ rather than a low view of Christ. And it's easy to establish a high view of Christ. Just read the scriptures and believe the scriptures. It's easy to have a low view of Christ. Just listen to the world. Read the billboards. Believe what people say about you. It'll drag you down. Listen to the isms. There's more false information out there than there is true information. Matter of fact, um, I won't tell you who brought this false information in here, but I just had a magazine given to me from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And uh, it's full of information on how the LGBTQ movement is affirmable. It's all right. It's okay. And so there's an entire Baptist denomination out there. I hate that they have our name Baptist, but nevertheless, um, that is the case. So we stand for the fullness of deity here Look again in the area of the fullness of deity. Verse 9 again. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells. All the glory, all of the grace of God, all of the atonement, the entire trinity, all of the essence here is fully God, fully man, fully the Holy Spirit. Now, Greek philosophy taught that matter was evil, right? And that spirit was good. In context, the new converts and even the outside community, they could never, ever, ever imagine spirit and flesh coexisting together. They could never even fathom the, what Paul is saying as true. They, they, they just, it's a shockwave. And so when you was to, when they were to witness to someone, it's like, what you're saying is absolutely crazy. It's ludicrous. I, I could never even think of this. It's like oil and water. It doesn't mix. So that's the state of evangelism in their context, kind of like us today. What you're saying is crazy. You want me to die to myself and live? That makes no sense. What you're saying to me is crazy. I don't understand how I'm not a good person. I've never killed anybody. How can someone dying 2,000 plus years ago do anything for me today? All of these, all these crazy ideas. And that's the reason why we lean on the power of the gospel. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and let's see where this fullness of deity goes. It's pretty interesting. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. Philippians 2, 5 and 11, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right there in verse 11, Jesus Christ is Lord. This is absolutely astounding. This claim is hard for them to comprehend. This fullness in the Greek, pleroma, it is to be interpreted. Well, let me just put it in form of a question. Is it to be interpreted literally? When you think of the word fullness and all of what the deity represents, do we interpret this literally or figuratively? What do you think? Do you think literally or do you think figuratively? Literally, yes. We interpret the scriptures literally, right? Grammatically and historically, contextually. It's not subjective here. Subjective reasoning would divide up the Godhead. And yielding to Gnostic thought at this point would say this way. That 
deity descends down through intermediate states in stages and the lower you go the less deity there is and so what they perceived Christ to be was perhaps a little God you know a little bit of deity he's in in the flesh he couldn't be like a Greek God he couldn't be an almighty God so they that in progressive stages they're dividing up the deity of Christ and these stages are progressively less divine and so what they're hearing they're hearing Paul say this is what you want but Paul's not saying that and we need to be aware of what perhaps those whom we are evangelizing are hearing us say and so say to them what do you hear me saying and sometimes you'll be surprised at what they might say and then you have the ability to clarify what you are saying and what you are not saying. So it's very important because you, you really don't know their background and, and their mindset. This is Greek to me, right? When you think of witnessing to a Gnostic, I'd have to really study to witness to someone who is stooped in Gnosticism. And, 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 and this is a frame of mind, a thought, a worldview that is, has been outside in the world in Colossae, but now it's crept into the church and it's grabbed on to these new believers. And Paul's fighting for their lives. He's saying, I've got to clarify this for you because this is threatening the very deity of Christ. And the gospel that you're now going to push forward is not going to save. It's heresy. So he's really in it to win it here. And he's fighting for their souls. Now let's talk about deity dwelling here for just a moment. The word dwells is in the present tense. This is interesting because it means that the deity is continually dwelling in Christ. Continually dwelling in Christ. This is in the present tense. Let's read Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 again. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells. This is the verb of the sentence. This is where the action is. And so the deity is dwelling. Dwelling means to settle down and become at home. And so God's full deity is settled and at home in Christ. Now, Ephesians chapter 3, turn there with you would with me. And let's read verses 14 to 19. And look at how Christ is dwelling now in you. And that fullness of who he is, is inside you. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your heart. You see that? So this present tense dwelling is all of the deity of God in Christ now, according to verse 17, is in the believer. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ. Guys, this is a lifelong endeavor to get to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. There is no entertainment that compares to dwelling with Christ. There's nothing better than Bible study. There's nothing better than prayer and reading the word. There's nothing better than worship. We have a one-odd monster in, in all of our houses, some of us in every bedroom of our house, that robs our time away from being and dwelling with God. Then my wife and I were just talking the other day about how much smarter it seemed that those were in the 16 and 1800s. Well, they didn't have a television robbing hours and hours and hours of their daily time away. Christians had the word of God and they were dwelling and living with him. I'm telling you, if you turn your TVs off for a month, it'll radically change your life. 
If you dedicate the time that TV robs from you into Bible study, you'll be one of those crazy Christians that's on fire for Christ. You'll be labeled. You'll be getting emails like me. We'll, we'll, we'll be like, you know, hanging out together talking about how we're getting persecuted, which is whatever. Now, I have a question. When it comes to the deity of Christ dwelling in you, hmm, does his deity residing in you make you deity? Okay, we got the smart verbal side over here. Does the deity residing in you make you deity? No, nobody believes that? I was hoping for somebody. Watch this video. Me! I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. Now that was hard to watch. Stephen Furtick graduated from North Greenville Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Stephen Furtick has a Master's of Divinity from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He was discipled personally by Perry Noble, who was the pastor of New Spring, which was the largest Southern Baptist, second largest Southern Baptist church in the denomination. And by the way, Perry Noble played Highway to Hell on Easter Sunday morning with fire and everything by Perotex. So that's him. Perry Noma also became a cursing pastor and an alcoholic and beat his wife and got fired. It seems that um, now Stephen Furtick has gone beyond the means and methods that Perry uses. And Stephen Furtick learned a lot of these things and these ministry tactics from Perry. And he pastors Evelation uh, 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 Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he has a few mentors. Now, he just said, yeah, he said it, I am God Almighty. You heard it. Now, he believes something that we don't believe. And he's a false preacher. He's a false prophet. And he has got to be called out. We have got to get the gospel to those who are in that church. I've, I have personally spoken with those who have been on staff at Elevation Church and I kid you not, he has uh, photographers, you know, photoing him. And it's all about him. I could go on and on and on about this false prophet. But this here, guys, is something that has to be called out. We've got to be able to recognize this. But more than being able to recognize something like this, that's pretty blatant. And that's pretty obvious. But as for us in our own life, how do we interact with someone who was listening to Stephen Furtick every single week, and they start to take on this theology. Can you, with your own Bible, sit down with them and lead them out of that heresy? That's the reason why we do 3D Bible study here. You can simply take a text of Scripture and dig in for yourself and sit down with them and discover the truth of God's Word. And so nevertheless, we believe in training and equipping here and we're simply snatching them from the flames. We're doing everything that we possibly can. Now, one of his mentors is T.D. Jakes at the Potter's House. And this is a prosperity preacher. He believes in modalism. Modalism is a heretical doctrine that denies the Trinity. It pretty much says that um, the deity of Christ or God or the Holy Spirit is just in one mode at one time. Each part is just representative. It's not coexisting, okay? So it can switch different manifestations. It simply denies the doctrine of the Trinity. And that is what um, T.D. Jakes proclaims. And in order to be able to say what Stephen Furtick just said, he has to believe modalism as well. And then further beyond that, T.D. Jakes believes in oneness, Pentecostalism, which rejects as well the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, T.D. Jakes is, is pretty bad when it comes to his theology. And um, nevertheless, someone can still get saved if he preaches the gospel one day because it's the power of the gospel and the salvation. Okay, so I'm not bringing all that into, you know, question. I'm talking about theology. But 
Jesse Duplantis, another one of Stephen Furtick's sidekicks or models from whom he looks up to. Jesse Duplantis actually said this, you choose when you live and you choose when you die. Can you believe that? And he based that off of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, life and death is in the tongue. He actually said, life and death is in the tongue. The power is in your tongue. Your life and your death is in your hands. He also said that God asked him for his opinion too. So, (laughs) nevertheless, I digress. Back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Get back to the good stuff. You need to know how to say what's right, but at the same time, in order to clarify what is right, you have to be able to say why it's wrong. And so we have to be able to know what's out there. You have to be aware of what's going on. Uh, Do you guys believe that? Uh, If you don't, let me just give you one verse of scripture real fast, just to make sure that you know that we're called to be apologists. We're called to be evangelists. We have to know the enemy. In 1 Corinthians, in the last chapter, chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Be on alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Be on alert gives you the clear idea of knowing what's out there so that you can be on alert and know what you're faced with. So how can we defend our faith if we don't know what we're fighting against? We're called to be Christian soldiers. That's a very simple battle strategy to know your enemy. And you also have to know yourself and know your weaknesses. So nevertheless, we have to be engaged and know what's going on. We cannot seclude ourselves in a holy huddle. We can't be Amish. As many of you want to go and hide somewhere and eat cheese and grow potatoes, we can't do it. We have to continue to refine ourselves here and go out into the world and share the gospel. And when you do that, when you are a Great Commission Christian, you're going to be faced with things like this that you're going to have to be able to interact with. And it's okay to say, I don't know, let me get back to you, by the way. So, bodily form. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Uh, the, my mind went right away to the subject of an unborn person having personhood. Look with me in Matthew chapter 1. And even the deity or the personhood of our Lord Jesus Christ as being ascribed before he was born. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now, all of the deity is now in bodily form. No matter how big that body is, all of the deity dwells in Christ in bodily form. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary and his, uh, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with, what does that say? Child. Before Christ was born, he was a child. The personhood of Christ is identified here as a child by the Holy Spirit. And so that is important that we recognize the value, the personhood of an unborn baby. Now as well in John chapter 1 is probably the most well-known case for the deity of Christ in bodily form. John chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 14. This is, I'm telling you folks, a very high Christology And if you're going to have a high view of God, you're going to do well. If you're going to have a low view of God, you're not going to do so well. The, um, let's see, John the Baptist said it this way in John 3, 30. He must increase and I must decrease. We cannot think highly of ourselves. We have to continuously move ourselves aside. We want to be in the shadows and let Christ get all the glory. And so when we're lifting up the name of Christ and we're talking about Christ, then he gets all the glory. But most church models and ministries and even attractional worship and even a way of presenting the gospel and decisionism makes us valuable and it severs, you picture the pie graph, and it puts you in there as an essential part of things. And that, and that, that falls underneath this heresy. So let's look at the deity of Christ in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Verse 14. And the word became flesh and it dwelt among us. Who's he talking about? It's Christ. The word became flesh. This is the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is him in bodily form. And so Jesus will always be the God man. Jesus is God. In John 10, 30, he said, I and the Father are one. Now, to kind of start to land the plane here, D, document on your 3D Bible study sheet, gives you a, a series of methods to be able to divide the Word of God, to rightly divide it, and to ask good questions, and to find out the facts, and it takes a little while to do this. This is legwork for you. Stay up till one or two, okay? Um, burn the midnight oil. Dig into the text. Get a good concordance. Get a good Bible study dictionary. Um, get a study Bible and use the, the references. Leave the study notes for last. Write down what you discover, and then after you're all done, compare them to the theologians. You'll really be like, man, I am smart, you know? <laughs> And what it is, it's the Holy Spirit helping you to discover the truth of God's word because he wants you to know it. This is glorious. And so, letter A, find the theme. Read the text some more. Let me interpret this for you. Read the text some more and some more and some more and some more and some more, <laughs> okay? Read the whole chapter again. Read the whole book again. Read it over and over and over again and get the theme, get the overarching theme. Now, the theme doesn't change every single paragraph. The overarching theme here is completeness in Christ. So in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, and in him you have been made complete. It just happens to be that this is the main idea of the chapter right here beside of us. So I wanted to share that with you. But here in our text, the theme or the sub-theme, I should say, is that Christ is the God-man. Christ is God. And so letter A, Christ is God. Letter B, now just explain the text. Now, if you're taking on more than one verse or uh, a paragraph or a passage, whatever the pericope is that you're studying, you want to go through and put it in your own words and just simply write out on your document what the text is saying. And this is when, when I'm teaching our Bible study teachers how to teach the text. I say this often, just teach the text. Say what the text is saying. Repeat what God has already said. Say it in different words. Get a thesaurus, use different words, paint, brush, describe, illustrate, all of these things. And so explain the text. And in short, the, the very, very short here, the text is simply combating heresy. So Paul combats Gnostic heresy. That's, that's kind of what's going on. Gnostic heresy didn't believe that flesh and spirit could dwell together, and now Paul says that the full deity is in Christ. So that's what he's doing in the text. They didn't believe the two could co-mingle, and he's saying, yes, it does, and it's in Christ. Letter C, interpret the text. Now, this is one of my favorite ways of saying it. You've heard the passage in the Bible that says to greet one another with a... a I hope, yeah, you've heard it, right? So sometimes I'll take the guys in my office and I'll say, turn to this passage. And I'll say, hold on. You, um, you believe the Bible, right? And they say, well, yeah. I'll say, well, you believe and do what the Bible says, right? And you apply it. Say, oh, yeah. You know, so I want you to read it and do it. Y'all too, right here, okay? <laughs> and, and I stand back and they read it out loud and you wouldn't believe the looks I've gotten. I say, do it, guys, do it. Now, here's the question. The question is this, can you explain to me why it's not right to kiss another brother, <laughs> right? Can you do inductive Bible study? Okay, well, that would be a way around explaining it, but you take the passage and you simply say, this is about greeting, greeting. The, the passage, the emphasis here, the main idea is greeting. I've observed the text in context. It's about greeting. Now, you go from observation to interpretation, then application. Don't skip this most important step. So, interpret the text. Guys, listen. Greeting is important. When someone walks into your fellowship, you need to greet them. Everybody has worth. And if you don't greet them, it nullifies everything in their heart and mind. All they're thinking about the whole time is nobody said hello to me. 
Oh, they walked right by me. They ignored me. Greeting is very important for a lot of different reasons. So greet one another. That's the interpretation of the text. Greet. Now, apply it in your context. What's appropriate at Beulah Baptist Church in a form of greeting? Well, it's not kissing. I'll, I'll tell you that. So continue to greet one another. And that being the case, now we continue in this area of interpretation. Letter C, interpret the text. Ask the question, what does this mean? What is being pointed out? This is how you probe the text and rightly divide it. Letter C is simply this. Jesus is all of what Scripture says God is. Amen. Jesus is God in short, but more so, Jesus is all of what the entire of your word of God says about God. Jesus is God. Now, you think to yourself, okay, well, let's drive the point home. That's pretty general. Well, all you got to do is back up to chapter 1 and verse 16. How, then, is Jesus God? Does anybody know verse 16? This is one that you really would do good to commit to memory. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created. Hmm. For by him... All things were created. What does this say about Jesus? He's the creator. He is God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is literally shattering the minds of those who are in Colossae who do not truly know who Christ is. When they're thinking to themselves, you can't mix deity and flesh, and now this apostle Paul is saying that Christ is is the creator God. This is important. Interpret the text rightly. And then as well, we might as well continue to drive it home just a little bit. John chapter 14 and verse 1 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So here we have Jesus making a self-proclamation of the fact that you believe in God. Yes, all of who God is. Believe also in me. And he already said it, by the way, in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one, right? And so all of Scripture and what it says about God is all of Jesus. They are co-equal. They are one. Now, letter D, apply the truth. A ask the question, how do I apply this in my life? Turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. And let's read verse 24 a couple times. John chapter 8, verse 24. I'm glad you brought your Bibles. John chapter 8, verse 24 is, again, when you're doing your own Bible study and you probe and dig on how to apply this, the Lord may lead you in a, in a different place, but here is one place that it, it really, really explains where the rubber meets the road. John chapter 8 and verse 24. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. How does this apply? Well, it applies because if you do not believe in Jesus, you will die in your sins. That's how it applies to our lives. And if you believe that, you'll evangelize. And if you believe that, then you'll live it out. You'll have a burning desire for others to know this verse. I'm saying to you, you're going to die in your sins unless you believe. That is huge. In letter E, the same verse, this is so potent when you patience of what you have found in the text. Now follow me. You've studied out the verses. You've looked up the words. You've taken notes on each word that is of significance, the nouns, the peoples, the places, the persons, everything. And you know the context. You've read it over and over again. And you've found some themes here, some main ideas, some points. Now, let's talk about the implications of what if I don't. This is where you act like a rebellious teenager. You say, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, let's look at what that looks like. All right, right here. Letter E, state the implications. What will happen if I don't Practice this. Again, verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die 
in your sins. Now you can talk about eternity in hell, a real place with literal flames. It's not metaphorical. It's not anything other than real flames for eternity. It never stops. And you talk about the implications of not believing that Jesus is God. And that is where you really get a sober idea of like, this is, this is not, I mean, isn't, this is really real. I mean, this is so real, it doesn't stop being real. Not only does God's essence, his deity, continually dwell in Christ, but now when we are saved, we're saved, gloriously saved, according to John chapter 14 and verse 6, we're going to get to heaven because of him. But if we don't, this is an eternal destination where you will be separated for God for eternity and suffer in hell forever. Now, what about letter F, illustrated? What do other passages in the Bible teach about this? What do other passages teach? How can you illustrate this with the Bible? You've, you've got this fundamental hermeneutic in mind, and that is this. Scripture interprets Scripture. So what you read in one place, it cannot contradict another place of Scripture. So... Um, what can we use to illustrate it? We'll back up a little bit more to John three thirty six to kind of drive the same point home again. Illustrate this. Letter F, talking about illustrating, John three thirty six. He who believes in the Son, that's what we've been talking about the whole time, Belief in the deity of Christ. He who believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. Now there's a conjunction here that shifts the momentum and it becomes not encouraging but a fearful thing. He who does not obey. Oh, hold on a second. It didn't say not believe. It said he who does not obey the Son will not see life. This is missing in our culture today, folks, from when we do easy believism. Just raise your hand and be saved. Just believe. Just believe. Who believes in Christ? Well, who believes? The demons believe and tremble, right? Have you told somebody that before? Do you believe in Christ? Well, the demons believe in Christ. The real issue is whether or not you are a true believer in Christ because if you have been regenerated... If you have a new heart, then you have new desires. And those new desires are in you from God Almighty. And the Holy Spirit of God that now dwells in you as a deposit causes you to want to do different things than you used to do. And those things that you now desire to do align with the scriptures and you want to obey Christ more than anything else. In fact, you fear not obeying him. And you wonder with anxiety if you have perhaps offended somebody. It's the, it's, the, it's, it's the fear of God. It's the anguish. It's the, it's the desire to truly want to please the one who is your maker and the one who gives you life and the one who gives you provisions. You, you desire to obey him more than anything else in the world. No law is going to keep you from obeying Christ. No erroneous church ministry philosophy is going to keep you from worshiping Christ. Nothing is going to keep you from obeying him. You want to obey him so much so that you'll deny whatever it takes to be an obedient believer. Why? Because as you're delighting yourself in the Lord, he's given you the desires of your heart. And these desires are in alignment with his word. So read it with me again. He who believes, this is true belief, not just a, a proclamation. He who believes in the son has eternal life. But the one who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, illustrate this by reading the book of Revelation when it comes to the wrath of God abiding on you. That's pretty scary to think those who are not obedient are going to see the wrath of God. Those who do not truly know Christ, they're simply professors. There's, there's more out there. The reason why I'm so passionate about this is because there is more out there that think they're saved, then they're really saved. The road is narrow. Amen. And if we, the church, don't truly get that, then how is the vital information going to get to them? The world's not going to tell them. It's only you and I that can spread the true gospel. 
save they grabbing a Bible or picking up a track that's left around and finding the gospel, which we left lunch with these lovely ladies over here, their family, and they were going to the same parking lot we were going. And I'm like, they've been here. There's a track there. There's a track there. There's a track there. And we got some real evangelists in this church, and I commend all of you. So listen, the wrath of God abides on the person who does not obey Christ. And when you read the scriptures, obedience and not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, giving, worshiping, evangelizing, discipling, studying the word, worshiping him. You could go on and on and on about the evidences of a true believer, loving the brethren, being one who is, get this, regularly confessing your sins. A true believer trembles before God. And when you err and you sin, the conviction that lays on your heart will keep you up at night. And you cannot live without true confession. First John 1 John 1.9 is to believers. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And to live cleanly before God is the only way for a true believer. Non-believers can sin all day long and, and not have a convicted conscience. But true believers desire to obey God so much that they'll do anything for reconciliation. They'll do anything to be right with God and others. To love God and to love others is the summarization of obedience in the whole law. So letter G, apologetic. I told you we're all apologists. Some of us may be better than others, but we're all apologists. And that is simply defending the truth by refuting the opposition. And so, in short, I just simply say to you, the opposition, all the cults out there, Everything that offers, offers anything other than Christ and Christ alone at the end of the road is full of contradictions. And God cannot lie. He is not a hypocrite. And, and true religion doesn't have these contradictions. So the opposition is full of contradictions. Cults that do not believe in the deity of Christ, they, they contradict themselves all over the place. You can simply look at Islam and you say to yourself, how can a Muslim truly serve Allah and say that I am loving when Allah calls for them to kill the enemy? Aren't you supposed to be loving and evangelizing those who don't believe in their God, Allah? There's a contradiction there. And so when you follow unbiblical doctrine, it leads you in unstable ways, full of contradictions. And um, if you have a 3D Bible study sheet, write the letter H down at the bottom. When we go to print these again, I'm going to include this last question. What does this reveal about God's character? It's really missing in our cap on this study here. What does this say about the character of God? And I'd like the scriptures to be able to speak for themselves. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll read verses 15 and 16. As we start to close, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says much about this and how this passage in Colossians is talking about the fullness of deity dwelling in Christ. What does this say about God? Well, it says a whole lot. And believe me, you can make an entire Bible study out of each of these points. And just simply to grab one point and to talk about them is to, to help us tonight to get a scope on how to study the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 is going to help us to see that Christ understands our weaknesses and he can help us. This is one way that we see that all the fullness of God dwelling in bodily form can help us in bodily form. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that beautiful? It's almost like you can come to your heavenly father anytime with any baggage, with anything that you've done, with anything at all you, that you need to say, with anything that's happened to you, there is nothing in which Christ cannot sympathize with you because he in every form has been tempted, beaten, battered, and bruised, yet sinless. And he knows how to help you. 
He knows how to help you where you're at, no matter how big or how small that little problem is. And don't be afraid to come to him in confidence. Be confident in coming to him. Don't shy away. One of the worst things I see often as a pastor is when one of the sheep do something wrong and they become ashamed of what they've done and they fall away. Rather than drawing closer to God, they fall away. Rather than having a, a trusted Bible study group whom they can confess their sins to and they can talk about it and they can pray about it and get it done with, they, they fall away and they get estranged and it's nearly hard to get them back because they're embarrassed. Don't be like that. You've got a trusted group here, a Bible study group who loves you. And if you don't want to be in this one, come on a Sunday morning and get closer with our women and our men and our, and our Bible study groups. This is Christianity. And when you approach God in confidence, you confidently say, Lord, I am sorry. He will anything that has ever happened to you or anything that you've ever done. And he can help you because this is part of who God is. He is a good and loving shepherd. He wants to help you in times of trouble. He is the caring father. Have you said, oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Have you really understood the word father, the right father, the truest father, the loving father who is going to scoop you up and care for you no matter what? This is some of what we can see in this verse tonight. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the time that we've spent in Bible study. And as we transition now to worship you and give you due praise, I pray, God, that the saints have been edified, your word has been expounded upon clearly, and that you will continue to get the glory here at this dear church. Thank you for what you're doing. We give you all the honor and glory and praise in Christ's name. Amen.